Maybe you make no claim to faith. You're not a Jesus follower. Maybe you used to be. Maybe something happened in your family when you were growing up and the whole church thing just sort of blew up. Or maybe you grew up in a family that didn't go to church and you just never learned much about God, about Jesus. If I brought you up here today and you told your story, you said, you know, somebody died in our family and I just couldn't get why God would allow that. And I said at that point, I'm done with God. Or maybe a Christian wronged you. This person claimed to be, oh, so good and righteous, but not by me. You said, I'm done at that point. We'd all say, we get it. We understand. But maybe you say to me, I tell you what, I'll give you one chance to convince me to be a Jesus follower. You know, from my experience, from what I've heard, I'm not interested. But you give me your best shot to convince me to consider Jesus. Well, with that deal, I wouldn't try to explain to you the bad things that have happened in your life. Why? I wouldn't try to defend the person, the Christian who wronged you. I would take you to one thing. Within weeks of Jesus' death, there were like 10,000 people who believed he was raised from the dead. Now, there are a lot of religions today. They embrace a, a, a prophet. They embrace uh, some teachings, some philosophies, a book. But for followers of Jesus, the whole thing does not depend on teachings or a philosophy. It hinges on one single thing, the resurrection. Jesus healed a lot of people. He taught, and people said, wow, his stories are amazing. But the biggest deal was when he, when he raised a man from the dead. This guy was in, buried for like four days his name was Lazarus, and Jesus raised him from the dead. I mean, before that, there were thousands of people who followed Jesus, but then they all started coming out of the woodwork to believe in Jesus. And the Jewish religious leaders got together at that point, and they said, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So they hatched a plot to put Jesus to death. And in two weeks, they pulled it off. Jesus was crucified on the cross. When that happened, all the people that followed Jesus just stopped. I mean, it was over. He was dead. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. When you say that, you can't die. So the whole deal was done. But then a few weeks later, hundreds of followers of Jesus took to the streets and they said, he rose from the dead. We've seen him. And soon it was like 10,000 people. Now, if you said, try to persuade me, I'd say, well, think about when you have family gatherings. And you know, people begin to tell stories of you know, how it was, you know, what happened and growing up and and, and, and somebody says, tell the story, time, and, and so you, you tell the story kind of quickly when it happened, where it was, and, and then when you get to the, the real center of it, the, the, the funny part, people say, what? What happened? And you slow it way down. Well, that's what happened with Jesus. There are four biographers of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell about his birth, his uh, his teaching people, his healing people. And, uh, but when they get to the death and resurrection, they all slow it way down. All four of them devote 40% or more of their narrative to the final week of Jesus' life. As historical writings go, that's unprecedented. Why do they do that? Because they say this is the main thing. 
it all hinges on the resurrection. I think you can believe the resurrection. Here's why. Mark, one of the biographers, writes, When the Sabbath was over, that would be Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, this would be Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? The first thing that Mark tells us about the resurrection is that women discovered it. Now, reading that today, you might not notice this, but in the first century, women had no status. If you committed a murder and the only person who saw you was a woman, you would probably go free because a woman could not testify in court. Her testimony was considered of no value. So one of the reasons you can believe the resurrection is because of the women. Did you take a religion class in college? I can pretty much tell you how it went. They said, you know, dead people don't rise. Everybody knows that dead people don't rise. So we have these accounts of a resurrection. It didn't happen. You know what happened is followers of Jesus made it up years later. Legends developed, and legends always can only develop like 60 or 80 years later when all the eyewitnesses have died. So they wrote this years later, this myth about a resurrection. But if you're making this up, fabricating this whole deal, you don't start it with women discovering it. There's another reason you can believe in the resurrection. Mark goes on, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Mark says the tomb was empty. The angel said, you're looking for Jesus? He's not here. He rose from the dead. Look at the place where he was laid. Women reported to the disciples that the tomb was empty. The disciples didn't believe them, so they ran out there and they found it was empty. Even the Jewish leaders admitted that the tomb was empty. Matthew, in his account, writes, While the women were on their way, some of the guards, there were guards that were guarding the tomb, went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while, he were, while we were asleep. Now, the only reason they would give a large sum of money to tell them to say that the disciples stole the body is because the tomb was empty. No Jewish leaders or Romans took people out to look at Jesus' cadaver. They would have if they could have. The site of Jesus' tomb was known to Christians, Jews, and Romans. So if it weren't empty, it would be impossible for a movement based on the belief in the resurrection to come into existence in the same city where Jesus was crucified and buried. And there's no way the disciples would steal Jesus' body. If they wouldn't stand up for Jesus when he was alive, they wouldn't stand up for Jesus when he was dead. People say that ancient people were really gullible. They would believe in anything. Ancient people were not stupid. Uh, they knew dead people tend to stay dead. Ed Davis tells the story of <coughs> a woman who looked out her window and saw their uh, German shepherd shaking the life out of the neighbor's rabbit. Now, their relationship with the neighbors was a little tenuous, and so she said she, she knew this was not going to be good. So she grabbed a broom, and she began to pummel their dog until he finally dropped the dead rabbit. At that point, she panicked. She took the rabbit inside and, and bathed it and took the hairdryer and blew the fur, you know, got it all dry, and then she combed it so it looked like a rabbit again. 
Then she slipped over to the neighbor's house and, and, and put it in the cage and, and propped it up there. About an hour later, she heard screams from the neighbors, and she says, what's going on? The woman said, our rabbit, our rabbit, he died two weeks ago, we buried him, now he's back. <laughs> Ancient people knew dead rabbits stay dead. New Testament a scholar N.T. Wright says there were a number of uh, would-be messiahs in the first century and they all ended the same way with the Romans crucifying them and there was no account of the followers claiming that the Messiah or that they came back to life they knew dead people stay dead so when Jesus was executed and buried his followers knew that it was over But then there were witnesses that said the tomb was empty. There's another reason you can believe in the resurrection. Mark goes on, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Uh, Mark says, Jesus appeared to the disciples. A reason you can believe in the resurrection is because people saw Jesus and boldly told others. In 1963, the body of 14-year-old uh, Ida Mae Collins, one of four African-American girls murdered in a horrific church bombing by white racists, was buried in Birmingham, Alabama. For years, the family would come and pay respects to her and leave flowers at her gravesite. Until 1998, they decided they were going to move her body to another cemetery. When workers went out to dig up the grave, they came back with a shocking discovery. The grave was empty. Well, the family was greatly upset, and due to poor records, the cemetery officials were scrambling to come up with an explanation. They had all kinds of theories. The main one was that they had put the tombstone mistakenly in the wrong place. But in all these explanations for what had happened, no one suggested that Ida May had been raised from the dead and was walking the earth again. Why? Because an empty grave does not a resurrection make. If it was just an empty tomb, but Jesus never appeared to anybody, skeptics could say it was just grave robbery. But Jesus did appear. The most important creed in terms of the historical Jesus is 1 Corinthians 15. This is written by the Apostle Paul. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Terms like Cephas which was Peter's old name before Jesus changed it, and the third day, which means uh, Jesus was crucified on Friday, and the third day, Sunday, he rose, and terms like the twelve are all very old terms, which tells us this is a very old creed. Here's the point. If Jesus was crucified as early as A.D. 30, the Apostle Paul was converted to become a Christ follower in A.D. 32. He was immediately ushered into Damascus to meet a Christian named Ananias. His first visit with the Jerusalem apostles, Peter, James, and John, would have been 35 A.D. Sometime during that visit, he was handed this creed, which includes the basic details of Jesus' uh, crucifixion, his burial, and a detailed description of all the people he appeared to in risen form all dating back to within five years of Jesus' crucifixion. I mean, it totally takes the wind out of the charge that the resurrection is a myth made up by people years later. I mean, the creed was written when thousands of eyewitnesses 
Both followers and enemies of Christ were walking around. If critics could have attacked it on the basis that it was filled with falsehoods and distortions, they would have. But that's exactly what we don't see. So we can pretty much throw out the argument that the resurrection was a mythology made up years later. The early creed tells us that Jesus appeared to Peter, the disciples, and to over 500 people. If you're a lawyer, you know that it, a court case today, you have a good case if you have two good eyewitnesses. Paul says, we have over 500. Then Jesus appeared to James. Can you picture how that went? James was Jesus' brother, his stepbrother, and he didn't believe in Jesus. And Jesus walks in in resurrected form, and James goes, oh, oh no, I am so, so sorry I didn't believe in you. What do you, what do you want? I'll do anything. Jesus says, how about you lead the church? And the church in Jerusalem grew to over 10,000 within a couple months. And then Jesus appeared to Paul. Paul writes, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles who do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul says, I know the disciples fled when Jesus was arrested. I know they betrayed him. I know they were cowards, but I did far worse. I killed Christians. I hunted them down and put them in jail. I don't even deserve to be on the same list with the apostles. So, we have Peter and the disciples who fled, were terrified, were cowards, and suddenly they take to the streets and say, Jesus, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they're speaking boldly. We have James, his half-brother, who didn't even believe in Jesus. All of a sudden, he's leading the New Testament church. We have Paul, who hated Christians so much that he would go from city to city to find them and put them in jail. Suddenly, he doesn't just ease off Christians, but he joins the movement. He's preaching Jesus all over. How did this happen? Jesus appeared to them. They saw Jesus was raised. There's another reason you can believe in the resurrection. The resurrection was to be a corporate event. Jews, for centuries before Christ came, all believed that at the end of time, all the dead would be raised. Nobody in Israel would have ever thought to claim that one individual had been raised in the middle of history. If somebody claimed that, the response would be, has disease been eradicated? Is suffering done? Is justice now reigning? Don't talk nonsense. Saying someone had been resurrected in the middle of history would be like someone today saying, this year, the Cubs' first baseman, Anthony Rizzo, will win the World Series, but the rest of the team will have to wait a year. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. Just like the World Series is a team deal, the resurrection was a team deal. There's no way anyone would make up a story about one person being raised by, from the dead all by himself unless that's what happened. Let me mention one last reason you can believe in the resurrection. Mark ends his account. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's the way Mark ends his gospel. What kind of ending is that? You have nothing about joy and hope and encouragement. You have the women afraid and bewildered and fleeing in silence. But the way Mark's account ends is one of the reasons we can believe the story is true. If somebody made this up, there's no way they would have it end this way. Some people say, well, we lost Mark's ending. Or something happened to Mark so he couldn't finish his gospel, like he died. Mark's gospel is way shorter. But no event is more noticeably shorter than his account of the resurrection. 
I mean, Mark devotes 20 verses uh, to the resurrection. I mean, Matthew. Uh, Luke devotes 53 verses to the resurrection. John gives us 56 verses about the resurrection. But Mark uses only eight verses. I think Mark deliberately ends it this way. He ends it abruptly and he wants you to write the end of the story. He wants you to take a step in response. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to Christ. Mark says, all right, the women discovered the empty tomb. And Jesus appeared in risen form to many people. Now you end the story. Do you believe in the resurrection? What difference does it make to you that Jesus was raised from the dead, demonstrating that he was the Son of God? What difference does it make to you if you're young married? How does this impact your life if you're single? Does it change anything in the way you parent if you have children? Or what if you're a grandparent? If you're going to school, does it make any difference in the way you relate to classmates and how you view yourself? What difference does the resurrection make in your life? Maybe you say today, you know, I've heard you. And I'm convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm persuaded that he was raised from the dead, providing a way for my sins to be forgiven. Or maybe while I've been talking, something has been welling up inside of you, making your heart beat faster. That's the Holy Spirit leading you to Jesus. Whether you've been coming to church for a long time, you've been here many times, or this is your first time here, or first time here since last Easter, you're you realize you're ready to respond to the resurrection. Maybe you respond today, I'm curious. Uh, you didn't get it into the end zone for me, but I'm interested, I want to learn more. Or maybe you respond today, I'm back. I've been away from this whole God deal for a long time, but I see that Jesus being raised from the dead is so important. It means he's the Son of God that I want to get back, back to church, back to the Bible. Or maybe you say today, I believe. I didn't when I came in this morning, but I do now. As we end our time, I want to lead you in prayer. Would you bow your head, everybody here? I want to pray, and if the words I share uh, speak for you, I'd like you just to repeat them silently to God. Dear God, thank you for bringing me here today. I didn't know what to expect. And God, I'm curious. I'm not yet convinced, but I want to know more about Jesus. So I'm, I'm willing to take steps to further this along. Come back to church, uh, read the Bible, talk to other people. Or maybe you say today, God, I'm back. This used to be a big deal in my life, and I've gotten away from it, but I see how important this is, and I'm telling you today, God, I'm back. I'm back to church. I'm back to reading the Bible. I'm back into finding other people that follow you. Or maybe you say to Jesus today, I believe. I never have before, but today I believe that you were raised from the dead and you're the Son of God. I am so sorry for ways I've sinned against you. Would you forgive me? And I want you to come into my life. In Jesus' name.